This is Motley Fool Answers. I'm Allison Southwick, and I'm joined as always by Robert Brokamp, personal finance expert here at The Motley Fool. Hi, Allison. Bro, I have big news. This What's that? This is I'm our now. 200 and first episode of Motley Fool Answers. Wow. Can you it, believe it, it? It feels just like 159 or so. Well, in this very special 201st episode of Motley Bull Answers, <laughs> what, what what is the uh, the typical gift you give on a 201st anniversary? <laughs> well, I totally missed it because Chris was like, "Did you realize that your next episode is your 200th episode?" Which was last the week. The last episode. And I was like, "Nope." And so that's why we're acknowledging our 201st. And thanks, Chris, for paying attention. Yeah, <laughs> I think okay. it's the postcard anniversary. The po- <laughs> <laughs> Send them in, folks. Uh, all right. So, anyway, hooray. Hooray. It's been a fun journey. Thanks for going on it with me, both of you guys. It has been fun. Yeah. Highlight right. of my job, as I always say. In this week's episode, I'm going to once again come to the defense of millennials while Bro Camp offers advice on how to disaster proof your finances. The awfulizer strikes again. <laughs> all that and more on this week's episode of Molly Full Answers. So, Allison. What's up? Well, bro, as you may know, I'm on a little bit of a mission to get people to stop bad-mouthing millennials. It's a noble mission. Well, today we're going to look at a few studies that show millennials are actually pretty okay at something. (laughs) And that something is staying married. Really? Yeah. Did you not know this? No. Oh, okay. Well, according to recent analysis from the US of US census data by Dr. Philip Cohen at the University of Maryland, the divorce rate in the US dropped 18% from 2008 to 2016, and it's going to continue to drop all thanks to millennials. Good for you guys. So, why is divorce on the decline? Well, for starters, millennials are doing a lot of things differently than baby boomers, who are actually really good at getting divorced. (laughs) We'll, We'll have more on that later. So, what are millennials doing differently? Well, number one, they are waiting longer to get married. So, let's talk about the median age for first marriages for men is... In 2016, 29 and a half years old. Now, that is compared to 26.1 years old in 1990. For women, in 2016, the median age for your first marriage was 27.4, which is actually up four years than it was in 1990. In a previous episode, I think I went through some stats that showed like the age at which you got married was a big predictor of whether you got divorced. The younger you are, the more likely you are to get divorced. And why is that? Well, the, the, the word on the street is because uh, you're going to have better finances, you're going to be more established in, career, in your career, you're probably going to have a better sense of who you are. Yeah. Um, I remember my husband's aunt was reminiscing about how when she first got married, they had one car, they were living in a one-bedroom apartment with a baby, and her husband, Uncle Bill, was still finishing college. So, Oof. every night, she would have to pack that baby into a car to go pick him up from night school. <laughs> And I remember just being so stunned that, like, why did you make it so hard on yourself? You were going through all of this with a baby on top of it. Because that's what you did. Yeah. You got married and you started a family, whether you were financially ready or not. And millennials these days are just like, nah. Well, that's it. Nah. I'll wait. <laughs> all right. Number two reason why millennials uh, stay married are more likely to stay married. Women are more educated and career focused. So, looking at some additional research from the University of Maryland, this time from Dr. Stephen Martin, not the Stephen Martin you're hoping for. Oh, that wild and crazy guy. When the wife is more educated, the chances of the marriage lasting increases. So, how much? Well, from 1970s to the 1990s, rates of divorce fell by half, almost mm. half amongst four-year college graduates, graduates. But it remained relatively high for women with less than a four-year college degree. The divorce rate for women without undergraduate degrees has remained around 35% since 1980. But for women women with college degrees, the divorce rate has shrunk from 27% to 16% since the 1980s. Wow. All right, number three reason. I don't have hard numbers here, but I think it's a still valid point. We are all more accepting that we don't have to follow the same path. Yeah. So, marriage between a man and a woman is no longer the only path that we must morally feel obligated to take. (laughs) Growing LGBTQ acceptance is changing the norms around marriage, and and it's increasingly acceptable to just not get married. Right. So, here's a funny story. 
You probably played this game as a kid, too. I remember as a little girl playing Old Maid. Yep. The card game, I remember playing it with my grandma a lot. This was in the 80s. So basically, if you're not familiar with the game, the cards were all somewhat insensitive depictions of jobs. (laughs) So, for example, Moonshot Martha is a female astronaut. Oh, that's good. That is good. But she's in space doing her makeup. (laughs) And don't get me started on the Native American depiction. It's not great. Anyway, so in this game, you trade cards trying to make matches, and then whoever ends up with the single old maid card, a card of an older woman who never got married, you're the big old loser. (laughs) In the 80s, sitting on your grandmother's shag carpet, you didn't think about how incredibly offensive this game is on so many levels. So fast forward 30 years, and there I am, a mom, playing this game with my daughter, Hannah, for the first time, before I realized just how horrible it was. Where did you get the game? Someone sent it to us. They sent us a package of gold, old fish. I was like, gold fish. Old, old, go fish. And old maid. Old maid. So I'm like, oh yeah, I remember playing this. Let's play it. And we're playing it. And I'm increasingly like horrified. <laughs> so now what we do is we play a game that we call Independent Career Minded Woman. <laughs> and if you end up with the old maid card, you win. <laughs> Hannah prefers to play Go Fish anyway, but the point is, is like just that game as an example. It's so much more acceptable right. to not be married or to marry the person that you want to marry, regardless of their color, sexual orientation, etc. Anyway. Not only has the divorce rate declined for the reasons we talked about, it is expected to de- continue to decline. Why? Baby boomers. Yes, we already talked about how getting married younger and not having an education or financial stability can contribute to divorce, but there's also this vicious circle. So, even when they were young, baby boomers had unprecedented levels of divorce. And because remarriages tend to be less stable than first marriages, those that remarried are now once again, contributing to growing levels of divorces for those over 50. So it's called gray divorce. Yep. You maybe talked about this on the show as well. Yep. Pew Research found that among those age 65 and older, the divorce rate has roughly tripled since 1990. So yes, the divorce rate is expected to continue to decline because, again, baby boomers are the most likely to get divorced, and baby boomers are, how do I put it nicely, aging out of existence? <laughs> So they will stop driving. Moving out of the uh, sample size. Down the averages. Um, So here's actually now a a more interesting deeper dive. The gentleman who wrote the first study I mentioned that came out this week, Dr. Philip Cohen, he told Bloomberg that he believes marriage is now becoming an achievement of status rather than something people do regardless of how they are doing. Uh, So marriage is increasingly becoming something that well educated, financially stable people do. Meanwhile, Cohabitation is up, particularly among those who are poorer and less educated. And these relationships, uh, cohabitation, are less stable than marriage and are not being taken into account when you look at divorce rates, because they never got married to begin right, with. Right. So the demographics of people who are more likely to stay married, older, wealthier, educated, are increasingly more likely to get married in the first place, while those uh-huh. who are likely to get divorced aren't getting married to begin with. Um, Anyway, so it's fascinating to me that the idea that marriage itself, something that everyone was just supposed to do, is now becoming a status, a status, almost a status symbol. Right. You 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 build up enough money to buy a car, buy a house, and get married. Right. It's like one of those. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things. And if you if you haven't gotten all those other things taken care of, you don't get married. Yeah. Whereas before it used to be, well, you're going to get married, and then you're going to live in a your baby's going to sleep in a dresser drawer, and that's fine because that's what that's what you do. do. That's what you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody told me that recently, actually, because they went to a wedding in a part of the country where people got married a lot younger, mm-hmm. uh, and and she was shocked by how many people just said, "You just get married and have kids, and then you don't worry about how to pay for it. It'll just somehow take care of itself." Um, which I thought, which me as a planner, you know, was like, like no. that was absolutely not, that's absolutely not the way you do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. not now anyway. Increasingly right. less common is that. So, right. so, so to bring it around to finance, right? Is is that something we've talked about before? Is that divorce can be one of the most financially devastating things that can happen to you? Right? Oh wow, this is a great segue, isn't it? It is a great segue, right? And so, uh, and we know that people often get divorced because of money. So it makes sense that people like when women do have the four year degree and they do earn higher incomes it also introduces 
a certain level of stability, and it probably reduces one of the factors that can lead to divorce as well. Which is funny because they were in the study. He mentioned how it's it's more so remarkable that. Uh, Divorce rates are declining because, at least conventional thought used to be, well, if that's an educated woman, then she's gonna get divorced and go off and start up. But no, actually, she's going. You're gonna lead to all these factors of more stability in the marriage, right. as opposed to her being a more independent-minded woman who's gonna go off on her own and divorce her man, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so bro. That's what's up. So, Allison, a few episodes back, we discussed a study which found that from 2013 to 2016, there was a twofold increase in the rate at which older Americans, age 65 and older, filed for bankruptcy. Well, thanks to an article sent to me by my favorite podcast co host. That was me, and I sent it over Slack. Yes, you did. <laughs> that is true. I learned about another study that investigated the fallout from financial calamities. It was discussed in a really, really good article. On Quartz by Corinne Pertil, and the study is entitled, ready for this, Association of a Negative Wealth Shock with All-Cause Mortality in Middle-Aged and Older Adults in the United States. So, it's pretty long. It's written by several authors, but the lead author was Dr. Lindsay Poole, an assistant professor of preventive medicine at Northwestern. So, this is what they did. The study looked at almost 9,000 middle-aged Americans, and they really looked at two things. Number one, whether they had experienced a negative wealth shock of 75% or more over any two-year period from 1994 to 2014. So, in other words, did their net worth drop 75% or more? And two, their mortality over this period. In other words, were they still alive? And here are the findings. So, of these about 9,000 people, 9% had a negative net worth. Like, they just didn't have any money or they were so dead they had a negative net worth. 28% Experienced a negative wealth shock. So, of losing 75% 70%. of their wealth? Over any two year period. Really? 28%. Wow. But then, and here was the real shocker those who experienced a negative wealth shock were 50% or more likely to die in the following 20 years. In other words, they didn't just lose their wealth, they lost their health. The, the stress, part of the reason, is the stress that comes from experiencing such a financially tra traumatic event. Increase the chances that they would die. Or did they lose 75% of their wealth because they were unhealthy to begin with? So they controlled for all kinds of factors like pre existing health conditions, um, divorce, at least being divorced beforehand, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. Okay, okay. So that most of it was just what were the effects of the drop in their net worth? Sorry, but why did what was there a common thread to why people lost 75% of their wealth? No, they didn't, they didn't look at that. They just measured how much they had in things like whether they lost a business, okay. whether they had a drop in home equity, whether they had a drop in investments and stuff like that. And definitely, one of the, the events that was most correlated with dying sooner was a foreclosure on your house. Okay. And this period, 1994 to 2014, includes the Great Recession. So a lot of people did have that experience in mm -hmm. that period. So it didn't get into the causes, though, of exactly why their wealth dropped. Um, but the bottom line, of course, is, dear listeners, that uh, we would like you to avoid a negative wealth shock, and we definitely want you to live a long and happy life. So, today, what we're going to talk to you about is how to disaster-proof your finances. So, when you look at what causes a financial disaster, it basically comes down to three categories. Number one, it's a loss of income. So, it could be a job loss. Layoffs in your industry. Um, I remember when back in the day when there were video stores. We would go to a local video store, and there was this one woman who worked there. That video store went out of business, so we all went to a different video store. She ended up getting a job there. Oh yeah, that went out of business. Then she went to work at the local Radio Shack. Radio Shack Ooh. went out of business. So I think of her a lot with someone who's trying to work hard but just had a series of just bad luck. Yeah. Um, Another reason you'd have a loss of income is disability. Something happens to you medically, which means you can't do your job. And of course, for a household in general, it could be death, right? One of the breadwinners in the household passes away. So that's number one, a loss of income. Number two, it could be an unexpected and unmanageable expense. In most situations, that is medical. Some sort of thing that happens that costs you thousands and thousands of dollars. I just had knee surgery, and the total cost, not to me, thank goodness, because we have good, life, good insurance, was $5,000. And I look at that, and I'm like, what would I have done if I didn't have insurance, or if I didn't have particularly good insurance? 
Um, so thank you, Motley Fool, by the way, <laughs> for taking care of my knee. Um, but it might not be medical. It could also be car repairs, home repairs, having to bail out other relatives. There are lots of reasons why you could have a big ticket, unexpected expense. And then number three, a significant loss of assets and property. So it could be your portfolio takes a significant dive. Now, if it's a well-diversified portfolio over this time period, it has recovered. But that is not the case for everyone. They might have had too much of their money in company stock. They might have had a business or something that went under. It could be, like we mentioned, the home foreclosure. Or it could be, for some people, it's actually as simple as a loss of transportation, right? For, the, for probably the average people listening to this podcast, if something happened to your car, you probably have insurance or you'd be able to pay. But a lot of people, especially if you're working an hourly job, if you lose your transportation, you've lost a lot of your income, especially if you then have to rely on something like Uber or something like that until you can save enough to get another car. So those are the three main reasons why someone has some sort of financial calamity. So what can you do about that to prevent either prevent it from happening or when it does happen mitigate the fallout from it. So here we go. Number 1 is to share the risk with someone else and by that what I mean is insurance, right? Health insurance is crucial. Absolutely crucial. When you look at bankruptcies, the number one reason people go bankrupt is because of healthcare expenses. So having good health insurance. Easier said than done. Easier said In than many done. Cases. Yes. Um, then uh, life insurance is the other one. And as far as I'm concerned, if someone is re- in your family is relying on your income, you need life insurance. It's not even really a question about it. If no one relies on your income, you probably don't need it. But if you're a parent or you're taking care of relatives or you're, you know, you're a married couple and only one person is earning money, that person needs life insurance. And the person who's not earning money, if you're a stay-at-home parent, that person might need life insurance too so that there's enough money to replace and pay for the services that they're providing. Um, of course, property insurance. Everything, anything happens to your house or your car. I'm a big fan of high deductible insurance because that'll save you a lot of money. That doesn't mean you have to have some cash on the side. But that's what that's made for, to, to take care of these big ticket expenses that you didn't expect, but to make sure that you're, you're adequately insured for those types of things. And I'm sure many people right now in the Carolinas are going through this situation mm. with all the flooding, hoping, hoping that they have enough insurance to cover all that. And then the final one is disability. And I said, this is the one that's always been more challenging for me. Statistically, what many financial planners will point out is that you are more likely to become disabled than to die. You're more likely to become disabled before your normal retirement age than to die before your normal retirement age. And a lot of these stats come from the Social Security Administration. So basically, you're three to four times more likely to become disabled before age 65 than to die. Those are the stats. My, my anecdotal experience is it doesn't happen that often. I even checked this with, uh, with our head of HR here at The Motley Fool, because we do provide disability insurance as a benefit. How many fools have ever become disabled? It's, it is pretty rare. Um, so I'm never, like, I, this is one of those types of insurance that I'm never sure to say. I don't say you definitely need it. It partially depends on your job, right? If you're like me as a writer, I could be pretty physically disabled and still do my job. If you are a surgeon, or if you have a job that requires a lot of physical effort, that to me argues more for disability insurance. So I would say I don't have a definite opinion about it. It's definitely something to consider. Number two, how to do in disaster proofing your finances. And it's the most boring advice in the world, and that's have adequate resources to replace or income or to pay for any expense. What that means, of course, is emergency fund. Emergency fund. Three to six months of must-pay expenses somewhere safe and cash accessible. It just <laughs> it's just so boring, but it's so important. Yeah. Well, no. I mean, it's not boring, but it's just I, you probably think it's boring because it's advice you give to everyone. It's right. everyone, and everyone to gives to everyone. Yeah. 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 Um, but, but still good advice. It's still good advice. But it's not just that, right? So you you have other resources if you if you if your emergency fund is enough or you don't have it. You could rely on home equity. You could rely on your retirement accounts. Um, but before you can even rely on those, you have to build them up. Mm-hmm. So a key component of disaster proofing your financial plan is start building up assets in any way you can do it, but having something you can rely on, even uh, some forms of life insurance as well. So the key is just to start building that up. Um, and say it again. 
What do you need in your emergency fund? Well, I say three to six months of must-pay expenses. And the more you have kids in your house, the more if you have like a mortgage and car payments, you need a bigger emergency fund. If you're single, you rent, you used to usually take the subway or the metro, you're probably going to be okay if something happens to your job, you have more flexibility. That's the way I think about it. All right. All right. Number three, keep your must-pay expenses manageable. What causes a lot of people to come in trouble is they lose their job or they have this big expense and they have no room in their budget. And that usually comes down to three related things. One, a big mortgage, two, a big car payment, or three, any other kind of debt. And of course, mortgage and car car loans are just another form of debt. But basically, these are things you can't get out of Mm -hmm. unless you sell those assets. So the more you can keep those manageable, the more you're going to be able to handle any other unexpected event to your financial plan. Number four, get your legal documents in order. And again, this is also pretty standard advice, right? You need the will, you need a living will, and you need to designate your durable power of attorney. And that's when it comes to disaster proving your finances, that one is key and probably underappreciated, right? So if something happens to you and you can you are in a no position to handle your financial affairs, someone has to be able to do that to pay your bills, file your taxes, make medical decisions, make financial decisions for you. So that's pretty important to have in place. You don't want to have a situation where, let's say, someone's in a car accident, they're in a coma. And then nobody knows anything about their finances. Nobody is legally able to make any decisions about their finances or their health care. So you want that in place beforehand. If you don't have a durable power of attorney, is there like a, a hierarchy? Like, okay, your spouse automatically then depends. Gets, if you're depends not married, the st- then your mo- mom. I don't know. Yeah, it depends on the state. Okay. The medical stuff is. Um, I mean, doctors will make decisions if it's medical necessary. Your life depends on it. Right. Um, finances are are different, right? I mean, even if if no one can access your bank account and your mortgage has to get paid, it has to get paid somehow, and you have to go through a legal rigmarole to be able to access someone else's checking account to take over their bills and stuff like that. Um, but that also isn't just durable power of attorney. That's also like making sure people have. Passwords to your accounts, right. and yes, all that. and that's and that's the final point under oh, this. Is sorry. thank you for leading into that. Okay, is basically tell people where to find it all and how to access it all. Um, and that's a you know you make that document, you share it with people, and you know, the people who are going to take over if necessary, they know where to find all of this stuff. They don't have to go rooting through your file drawers. In fact, that's difficult because they can't even get into your house legally. Like so, there has to be. It should really all be set up beforehand. Wow! So they need to. Have, it's so funny how like it starts getting into the nitty gritty where it's like, yeah, make sure they have dur- they have the durable power of attorney and also a key to your house and right. also right like right. literally. Like, I don't even think about. I didn't even think about that. Like, yeah. I, yeah. Okay. And even though you're, you know, it, it's your brother, right. you're not allowed to go break a window to break into their house to get their legal documents, right? right. So, right. <laughs> so yeah, you have to take all of that. Ahead of time, it's almost like you need to do a fire drill where it's like, okay, I'm dead, go, right. and then, then see where the process falls down. Where they're like, well, I literally couldn't get into your house to log on to your computer to pay right. your power bill. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then, of course, the it's not just you, but if something happens to one of your relatives, you're going to have to be the person who's picking up the pieces. So you got to encourage them to do as well. Your siblings, your parents, anyone else who you might have to step in and take care of something for them. Um, last two things. One is just work on your relationships, right? So and take correction, corrective action if the, you sense any disaster ahead. So we've already talked about divorce. Oh, okay. Right. So divorce is financially devastating. That doesn't mean you should stay married to the person, but. Uh, you definitely want to try to work on that. And if you sense that is happening, that there's a divorce on the horizon, you have to take correct a- corrective action for yourself. You have to build up your own credit score. You have to build up your own retirement savings. You have to start thinking about your career on your own and things like that. Um, but also, in any situation where someone needs help, who steps in? It's either friends or family. So, to the extent that you can build a good network to be there for other people and for their people to be there for you. That will help you. Bro's advice: Just be like a good person. Go make more friends. <laughs> exactly. You need more friends. <laughs> yes. Um, and then I got a bonus one. Ooh, anyways, okay. Uh, so one more is a factor employee benefits. 
when choosing an employer or just knowing what's offered. So, a lot of the stuff we have talked about here already is offered by many employers. Health insurance, life insurance, disability insurance, accidental death and dismemberment insurance. You know, here at The Motley Fool, if you lose an arm, you get paid a certain amount of money. If you lose two arms, you get a different set of money. We have that policy here. Um, you have the family leave policy, where you are, if you have to go and take care of somebody. Um, the ability to build an access retirement fund. So, not only do I have a good match so that I can retire when I want, but the more and faster you can build up your 401k, the more you can access it in an emergency if your employer allows it. Of course, we don't recommend that, but it's good to have there if you absolutely need it. Uh, more and more employers now have what's called an employer assist, employee assistance program, mm-hmm. an EAP. We have that too. Yes, and it's basically an outside company, and they call and they offer all kinds of services from counseling for stress relief to some do financial planning, some do um, help with debt consolidation and things like that. They helped us find Hannah's daycare. Yes, which is a very competitive thing in Northern Virginia. Yeah. Yeah, so definitely be aware of that. Some uh, employees offer prepaid legal. Um, so there are all kinds of ways. Travel assistance. Like I, I just recently went through all the stuff that the Fool offers, and they offer travel assistance. So if you're traveling and something happens to you, we have travel assistance that can help you take care of it. Many of the problems that happen while you're away. Huh. So number one, if you're out looking for a new job, factor that in. And as we've mentioned earlier, like the health insurance is probably key among all of those. Um, in where you decide to work, don't just base it on the salary, but also review the stuff that is offered by your employer because you might be offered something already that you just have forgotten about. And then finally, getting back again to the whole mortality thing, there's just no question that the, there's a connection between health and wealth. The better in shape you are, the less likely you are to need any health care, the more likely you'll be able to, and the quicker you'll be able to rebound. From any sort of health issues that you have, um, people who uh, in re- there's been surveys of people in retirement, and they ask them what's the number one determinant of your happiness. By far, it is health, not wealth. So, make sure you take care of your health because that will have a big impact on your ability, whether you'll be in any sort of disaster, but also your ability to cope with any disaster. So, uh, the bottom line here is you can't prevent the unexpected. Just by definition, it's going to happen. But you can mitigate the fallout by taking steps now to reduce the chances that a surprise doesn't turn into a disaster and increase the chances that you'll live a long, healthy, happy life. Which is what we want for all of our listeners. Which is what we want for all of you. So, bro, I learned something really neat this week. And what was that? And that is, I was talking to Annie, who heads up our recruiting team, and she said that it's not uncommon for people to mention in job interviews here at The Fool that they found out about The Motley Fool because of the podcast. That's ah. us! <laughs> and, of course, a team of like dozen other people here at The Fool. So, in the spirit of getting even more listeners to apply for jobs, I just wanted to give a quick shout-out Uh to talk about how we are really ramping up hiring here at The Motley Fool. Now, a lot of the jobs are here at HQ in Washington, D.C., but there are also jobs in Australia, Colorado, Singapore, jobs like data analyst, back-end developer, full-stack PHP developer, customer service, research analyst, legal and paralegal, lots of content marketing positions, editor analyst, and also writer positions for Fool.com, and oh so much more. There are like almost 50 open positions right really? now. Yeah, it's crazy. Wow. So. Listeners, head on over to careers.fool.com and take a look, uh, and also tell your friends. We're an amazing place to work, but don't tell your flaky friends. I don't want to work with your flaky (laughs) friends, but definitely go to careers.fool.com, take a look, see the jobs that are there, um, and apply. And then tell Annie that we sent you. Do we get a bonus? No. I know, but still, it's cool, right? That is very cool. All right. The show is edited (laughs) disastrously by Rick Engdahl. Uh, Our email is answers at fool.com if you want us to, if you want to say hi or send us a question. You can also send us a postcard. We're still accepting them. We will always (laughs) accept them. We're at 2000 Duke Street, Alexandria, Virginia, 22314. For Robert Brokamp, I'm Allison Southwick. Stay foolish, everybody.